Well, please uh, forgive me in advance for all the things that, that I may have to do to make it through this uh, message, such as speaking in a low voice or drinking some water or coughing from time to time. I'm just thankful that I have a voice that I still can possibly lose this morning. I'm glad it's still here. Well, uh, let's, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the text that uh, we're going to be considering this morning, uh, Matthew chapter 23, uh, verses 1 through 12. And uh, just to give you uh, a quick idea of what we're going to be looking at this morning, we're going to be looking, of course, at theme God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, we're going to get a good example of the proud this morning and how the Lord resists them in the Pharisees. And then we're going to see that uh, most perfect example we have of those who are humble in our Lord Jesus Christ this evening. So let's take a look at what, well, a good example of pride and how the Lord um, views it in uh, Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, Scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Uh, let me just point out that if there is one thing that uh, is epidemic in our society, it is the desire to stand out and to draw attention to ourselves. The Lord tells us that that is exactly the wrong way to go about becoming greatest in His kingdom. If we are to be the greatest, we must become the least. May the Lord uh, bless His word to our hearing this morning. Now, again, we're going to consider this morning another characteristic, another quality that the Lord is looking for in us that catches His eye, that, uh, you know, we use this term quite a bit in today's culture, but that makes us pop, you know, as it were. When the Lord looks at us, we stand out, we pop out. Well, that's what we should want, you know. We shouldn't want the Lord to be embarrassed when He looks at us, but rather to see something in us that He can use and so that's why we're going through this study. Now, this one is so important that the Lord tells us that if we have it in its highest degree, God will exalt us to the highest position in His kingdom. Talk about uh, standing out. Now, that quality that He's looking for is humility. Last week, we saw that uh, the one who keeps the commandments of God and the one who encourages others to do the same will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But this one may be considered even more important because it will make you the greatest. Now again, I thought a good way to go about this topic would be to look at the negative example this morning of the Jewish leaders. And then of course to look at a positive example this evening. A perfect example in our Lord Jesus himself so that we might better understand what it is we're talking about. Sometimes I think we, we see certain things in Scripture, but we don't really understand how it affects us or whether that's in us or even how to apply this. So I think looking at that, uh, well, very good example of pride in the Pharisees will help us to see what it is that God opposes, what it is that He actually hates. And that looking, of course, what he sees in his son Jesus will help us to see what it is he really delights in. So this evening, or this morning, we're going to look at two things. First of all, what Jesus says 
about the Jewish leaders that we should avoid, and he says quite a bit, we're not going to be able to look at all of it, but second, what Jesus also tells us that we should be, what we should do instead. So first of all, let's consider these Jewish leaders, and uh, Jesus has already said quite a bit in our text, but what I'd like to do is um, just to back up, I don't want to read this the last two chapters of the previous two chapters, that would be too much to go through, but I want you to understand as we look at this review of those, that Jesus had a lot to say about the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people that wasn't good. And he gets into chapter 23 as to why it is they were in this condition, what was causing all these things. So basically we have a series of indictments against the Jewish people from the time Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on the donkey to the time when, um, well, he actually uh, is betrayed and handed over to them. Uh, one of the first things that happened is Jesus went into the temple after he entered Jerusalem and there he found Jews that were buying and selling and changing money with the blessing of the leaders of Israel and the leaders of the, uh, of the temple, which would be the Sadducees. Now, they were supposed to be honoring his father, but as we see, they had become what we might call a bunch of self-centered, money-grabbing thieves. And so Jesus drove them all out. In the morning, he came to a fig tree, uh, looking, as it were, almost with a pretense to find some food on that tree, but I think knowing that there, was no, there were no figs on that tree. And then he cursed the fig tree, and it withered. What he was saying was that Israel had become a barren tree in the Lord's orchard, one that um, was not bringing forth the fruits of righteousness. And so the Lord was about to curse them, and they would wither. And that's exactly why 70 AD came about. Jesus spoke about two sons that his father had asked to go into his vineyard to work. One said, I will go, and he didn't. And the other one said, I will not, and he later repented and he went. Now, Israel was like the first son, always saying yes, but never really doing what the father commanded. But the tax gatherers and the harlots were the ones who first refused to obey, but when they heard Jesus preaching, they repented, they believed, and they did his will. Jesus said they would enter the kingdom first, but those of Israel would be left outside. Jesus spoke about a vineyard a man had planted and rented out to certain vine growers. Of course, this was God planting his vineyard in Israel, renting it out to the leaders of Israel and the Jewish people. And every time he sent to them his, his prophets, they would either mistreat them or kill them. And finally, and by the way, that is the history of Israel, Finally, they, he sent his son, thinking that they would respect him, and yet they killed him and threw him out of the vineyard, thinking that if they did this, the vineyard would be theirs. Again, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish people, refused to do his will, mistreated his prophets, and were about to kill the Son of God. And so God, Jesus says, was about to destroy them. He was going to take that vineyard away from them. He was going to give it to another people that would obey and would honor him. Again, going with what we just saw before, God takes the kingdom from Israel and he gives it to those who really do repent and believe. The Jews were the first to be invited to the great wedding feast of God's son. Everything was prepared and the father sent out his servants to gather them together for the feast, but they refused to come. And so God says he was going to destroy them and set their city on fire which is, again, what he did in 70 AD when he destroyed that city and tore down the temple. And he was going to invite others to take their seats at the table, which he did. And that, again, is the church. Now, the Jews, of course, were not stupid. They understood that Jesus spoke all these parables against them. And when they heard these things, they tried to turn the tables on Jesus by asking him some difficult questions. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? What about marriage? Uh, what about somebody who's married multiple times? Uh, who's he going to be married to in heaven? And which commandment was the greatest? And of course, Jesus answered all of those and they were not able to trap him. He finally answered or asked them a question that silenced them. 
Why did David call his own son Lord? Well, they refused to answer because the answer would mean that they would have to submit to him. Now, again, these were several indictments that Jesus was giving against the Jewish people um, that God was going to take the, the vineyard from them, the kingdom from them. He was going to destroy them and destroy their city. He was going to give the kingdom to another people. Others would come to the wedding feast and enjoy the blessings while they themselves would be cast out. Now, the question is, why? Why did Jesus say that? What was the problem of these people? Why did they refuse to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why did they refuse to believe Him or receive Him as their Messiah? Well, chapter 23 is all about that. And of course, Jesus gives them many indictments, not the least of which are the series of woes after our text, where He points out over and over again their sin, their evil, their hypocrisy. Now, I think we certainly want to listen to what Jesus has to say to them because we need to, uh, well, we need to understand that we do find some of these things, well, actually all of them, in our own lives to some extent, but thankfully not entirely as it is in the Jewish people, or at least in the unconverted Jewish people. We do need to remember that Jesus himself, of course, was Jewish. His disciples were Jewish. Many of the early believers were Jewish. God has not forsaken his people, as, as Paul writes to the Roman church. Those whom the Lord chose, believed, and the rest, of course, were hardened. But Israel, what Israel was looking for, Israel received when they received their Messiah. And those who did, though they still have remnants of sins, though they still have some of this in their lives, this... These chains, as it were, have been broken, as we've already seen, broken through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But still, again, even though our chains are broken, we still have to wrestle with some of these things, and if we don't, we will quench the Lord's Spirit. So what is it that Jesus points out in these verses, uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12, that will help us to understand how we might be better believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and those who would, of course, uh, catch the Lord's attention as He looks throughout the earth. Well, here are the things we ought not to be, beginning with the first four verses that tell us that these Jews receive these indictments because of their hypocrisy. They said that they love the Lord. They were His people. They had received the sign of His covenant. They had received His law. They were following Moses. And it's true that they were God's people by covenant. But they did not love Him as they should. And especially these leaders, as you know, oftentimes in Scripture, the Lord reminds us, as were the leaders, so were the people. When you have wicked leaders, the people follow them. And it's because that's the way the Lord has made it. And sadly, we often follow bad examples uh, uh, better than we follow good examples. However, they were following bad examples. And what were these bad examples doing? Well, they, as you know, were superficial believers. Everything they did was a show, an act. Uh, they wanted to appear as godly, but they really had no interest in honoring God at all. Well, what were they doing specifically? Well, as teachers of the law, Jesus says that they were telling the people to do one thing, but they themselves would do something else. Uh, Jesus told his disciples that they needed to submit to what they were saying because they were in the seat of Moses. What that means is that they had basically placed themselves as expounders, as teachers of God's law. Now, Jesus does point out that God didn't appoint them to this position. They seated themselves in the seat of Moses, as it were, in the chair of Moses. Uh, but yet God allowed it, and His disciples needed to submit to it as long as what they told them to do was God's will. They were, He said, however, not to do as they do, do as they say, but don't do as they do, because they say one thing and do another. They tell you what's right, but they do what is wrong. 
You know, it's interesting that they actually did several things. They also, he says, goes on to say that they made obedience even more difficult than it should be through their traditions by tying heavy burdens on the shoulders of their disciples and yet they themselves not even moving a finger to help them keep it. And I think this is what happens when sin gets in the picture. It basically will distort the truth in just about every direction. They say to do the right thing, but they do the wrong thing. On the one hand, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that they were making the commandments in a certain sense easier to keep, uh, saying that it really only had to do with, with our external obedience and not with our hearts. But then he lifts the law back up to where it should be. And yet we saw last week uh, as well that, um, well, I should say in, in this case, in in the uh, lifting up of their traditions or in, in producing these traditions, they actually made it, on the other hand, more difficult to keep than it should be. In other words, sin always goes to virtually every extreme. Have you ever noticed that? It, it distorts every truth that God has given. I mean, for just about any position that any Christian takes in the Bible, there's somebody holding the opposite position somewhere in, in Christendom. But that's exactly what sin does. It does it not only in what we are to believe, but also in what we are to do. So this warns us, first of all, that in our obeying the commandments, as Jesus told us last week, you know, the one who keeps the commandments and the one who teaches them or encourage other, encourages others to do them shall be called great in the kingdom. Make sure that the standard that you're using is God's standard. Don't let the commandments, as it were, we had a teacher in seminary who um, impressed this on us, and I think you would agree with me that what he said is right, that we don't want to make the commandments any stricter than they are. We don't want to make them any looser than they are. We just simply want to understand what God says and seek to do that. So make sure that that is what you are doing, that you are using what God says and not what you might think he says or what you heard somebody else say that he says. Make sure you understand what he says. Make sure that that is what you're seeking to do. Make sure you're living by that standard. And then as you try to encourage others to do the same thing, that you're encouraging them to go the same way and not making it harder or easier with regard to them either. Otherwise, again, we fall into the snare of the, the, the Pharisees. That is, uh, we, again, say one thing and do another. Now, the reason Jesus rebuked them as he did and was going to bring these judgments on them was, first of all, because of their hypocrisy. But they also had another problem, and that problem was pride. And that's where we get to our theme this morning. They loved authority. They love telling other people what to do. They love to exercise that authority, which is one of the reasons why they hated Jesus Christ, by the way. And you do know that uh, from the scriptures, they understood, the leaders understood. They actually knew who he was. They knew that he was the Messiah because he was doing exactly what Messiah would do. That's the reason why he indicts them in, in Matthew chapter 12 of having committed the unpardonable sin. Because Satan would not tear down his own kingdom. They knew he was doing this by the Spirit of God. And he also told them that what they had just done by claiming that he had done this by an unclean spirit was to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They hated Jesus because he threatened their authority. On one occasion, the high priest said, don't you see that it's necessary that one perish for the people, that the Romans don't come in and take away our nation and our place? They didn't want to lose what they had. And Jesus' popularity uh, threatened that. So they loved authority. They loved notoriety. They loved to be in first place. They didn't want to be in second place or take a back seat to Jesus. Secondly, Jesus says everything that they did, they did not to please God, not to honor God, but rather to be noticed by others, by one another and by the people. Jesus says they wore phylacteries. And that would be sort of an odd thing for us to see today if we saw somebody walking around with a leather box strapped to their forehead. 
But that's exactly what they were. And in these boxes were certain scriptures, and this was meant as a symbol that, that they had the commandments on their mind, that they were thinking about them and wanted to keep them. They also had tassels that were on the edges of their robes, and those tassels were also to remind them to keep the commandments of God. In other words, you're walking around with these visual demonstrations of your commitment to the Lord. Well, in some senses, they were doing what the Lord had told them to do in, uh, I believe it was Deuteronomy chapter 6, where he says that uh, these things will, will you know, put them as, as a sign on your foreheads and on the doorposts of your house. Don't forget them. But the problem is they made their phylacteries wider than they needed to be, and they made their tassels longer so that they would be more visible, so that others would see them and realize just how zealous they were for the law. It was a show. It was a matter of pride. Well, what else did they do? When they would go to a banquet, they wouldn't take the lowest place. Jesus told his disciples on one occasion, when you go there, don't do what the Pharisees do. Don't take the highest place. Take the lowest, because otherwise you may be asked to move down and you'll be shamed in front of everyone, or if you're on the lowest place, you'll be asked to move higher and you'll have honor in the eyes of everyone. These leaders would take the highest place because they wanted honor. When they went to the synagogues, they took the best seats in the house, which are the seats that virtually nobody takes in the church today, which is interesting, because they're not really considered seats of honor. We would say, well, the front row. I noticed uh, last night at the movie, the front rows were entirely clear, although we do have some seated uh, this morning in the front row, but it's usually the row that people avoid. Maybe it's because the person who's preaching can see them more easily. <laughs> One time we came uh, to John MacArthur's church years ago, wanted to come up from San Diego and, and uh, uh, attend one of the worship services. We got there a little bit late because we had to come from... San Diego, and where do you suppose the only seats were open in the entire huge, you know, sanctuary they had? The very front row. And of course, being in college, we were so tired, we had a hard time keeping our eyes open or trying to fight off sleeping, the eyes are closing, and suddenly he'll look at us and, you know, your eyes pop open. Well, that's why people don't like to sit in the front row, is because you can be seen. But these people, these Pharisees, liked to sit in the seats of honor, which were actually more like these chairs right here. There was a row that was, that was in front of where the speaker would speak and the people sitting in them would face the congregation. And that's where they liked to sit so that the congregation would be looking at them. They would be facing them. Again, something I think that most of us would not like. They love that. They also enjoyed being greeted with titles of respect in the marketplace and so forth, being called rabbi by men. Actually, when we think about these Pharisees, they sound a lot like some of the people we see in churches today, the celebrities. Now, not all the celebrities are like this. Some of them are not really seeking that attention for themselves, but because the Lord has blessed them in their ministry, people are flocking to hear them. And that's certainly fine. But there are others who actually set out to gain notoriety and to become celebrities and superstars. And certainly in the world, we have many, many examples. People want to be recognized by other people. They want to be celebrities. They want to be the stars, as it were. They want to be the idols of this generation. And of course, in the church, there are many who want to be leaders of mega churches. And we've all heard stories about people who've walked over the backs of others in order to get there. Well, that is what the Lord is telling us, that he does not want in us. God is opposed to the proud. So what does Jesus have to say about all of this? Did he approve of what the Pharisees were doing? Is this an example he wanted his disciples to follow? Is this what he wants you to seek after? Actually, the Lord tells you that what he wants for you is precisely the opposite. He doesn't want you to seek honor for yourself from men, but rather from God. He doesn't want you to seek notoriety, or in, in the first instance, he says to seek to be called by titles of respect. In their day, teacher, father, leader, 
or perhaps today, doctor, lawyer, president. You know, what is it that you know you used to hear? I'm not sure if we hear it that much anymore, perhaps in the world. But um, what is it that parents want for their kids? Well, they want them to gain honor and respect and riches and fame. They want them to be the most prominent. But that's exactly what the Lord tells us that we shouldn't be seeking after. I mean, these titles of respect are simply a way of gaining honor for yourself, trying to stand out as better than other people or anyone else. Jesus says rather than doing that, first of all, we should not see ourselves as better, but at the very least, we might say, as equals. Jesus says we have one teacher. That is Jesus. Don't be called teacher. You all have one teacher. And you are all brothers, he says. Don't be called father because there is only one father and you are all his children. And don't be called leader because you have one leader and that is Jesus Christ and you are all his followers. Instead, Jesus says, if you want to stand out rather than trying to stand up head and shoulders above everyone else and seeking honor for yourself, if you really want to be better, then this is what you need to do. You need to humble yourself and you need to be a better servant than others are. This is what's going to make you great in God's eyes. This is going to make you greater. This is what's going to make you uh, pop, as it were, when you humble yourself to serve others because that is something that is rare, even in the church. Jesus says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Is that, is that the way we think? I don't think that we often think this way. I think we still tend oftentimes to work according to the model of the world because the problem is when you humble yourself and you serve other people, you don't gain any notice. You sort of become invisible, don't you? Nobody notices you and you don't seem to get any honor for it. But the people who keep pushing themselves forward and trying to display what it is they have, they're the ones who seem to be getting the recognition. Something's not working the way it, it should. But the Lord never told us that we would get that honor necessarily in this world, right? And what does it really matter if we're honored in this world or not by anyone here, as long as we are honored by God in the end. It could be the one who is the greatest is somebody we don't even know about. The Bible is clear on the fact that God hates pride. He hates it when we try to make ourselves out to be better than others. Solomon tells us, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. James tells us, as we see in our, uh, actually, yes, in our memory verse, God is opposed to the proud. And Jesus says in verse 12 of our text, whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. What does God think about all these people who are putting all their gifts and attributes on display, who are displaying themselves? And again, most of the leaders of these mega movements are doing exactly that. What does God think about that? God hates that. God is opposed to them. Well, what about all these people that are following them? Why are they following them? Isn't that God's blessing? Because lots of people are following them? Well, if that's true, then the Mormon church is blessed. It has a lot of followers. Jehovah's Witnesses have a lot of followers, right? And churches that, well, would call themselves churches which we don't believed to be still churches because they've abandoned the, the gospel, such as the Roman church. It has a lot of people in it. Is it because it's blessed of God? Not necessarily. You see, numbers do not indicate blessing. We have to look in other places to see that blessing. For instance, are people being converted? Are people turning to the Lord and loving Him? Is the gospel being preached? Uh, are lives being changed? Is the kingdom of heaven advancing or is the kingdom of, of that individual advancing or those societies? We can't find it just in numbers. God hates pride and even when they have a lot of people following them because people like to follow people. If they get a charismatic leader, they want to follow him. Look at what Hitler was able to do. He got a lot of people to follow him, didn't he? A whole nation. Was he blessed of God? Obviously not. 
God hates pride, so we don't look at the results of what somebody does. Instead, we look at the principle. And the principle is God hates pride, but there is something that he does love, and that is humility. James says he gives grace to the humble. Jesus says whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, what are the limits to this? I mean, if we're, if we're thinking about, again, the idea of great and greater and greatest, you know, what are the limits of this exaltation? Just about how high is God going to exalt you? Well, you know what? The principle, again, is just the opposite of the world. Those who are exalted in the world are those who exalt themselves the most and can get the most people to follow them. But in God's economy, God will exalt you as high as you are willing to go low, we might say, as far as you are willing to humble yourself. I mean, who is the greatest in God's kingdom? It's the one who humbles himself the most to serve others. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see a perfect example of that this evening in the Lord Jesus Christ. So do you want to be great? You know, that's really not a question I should ask because it's inherent in us that every single one of us wants to be great. Well, you're not going to find the true greatness on the road that the world finds it, on the road of the proud, as Jesus reminds us on one occasion, that whatever they gain through their tactics in this world, eventually they're going to lose it all. The only way you can actually gain something and keep it is by humbling yourself. Now it begins with humiliation for sin and repentance of sin and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as our hymns uh, reminded us this morning. That's where it must begin. If you don't start there, then you can never truly humble yourself. You must be humbled by your sins and realize that before the Lord you deserve nothing but his judgment and realize at the same time that there is mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ for those who are willing to admit and forsake their sins and take hold of him. So that's where you need to begin. But then you need to humbly serve the Lord. Seek him, seek to serve him, and seek to serve others. And to the degree that you are willing to do this, to that degree, God is going to exalt you. The lower you go, the higher he will take you. And again, it goes against our nature, but that's exactly what the Lord tells us, and Jesus himself is the perfect example. So if you want to stand out, if you want honor, if you want glory where it really matters and the riches that you'll actually be able to hold on forever, you need to actually give it all up in this world and you need to serve the Lord and become a servant to others. And then when the Lord looks at you, he will see somebody that will pop, somebody that he can use because you are usable. Now let's think about that, and really this is part one of what we want to see also this evening, which is the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is infinite in every way, humbled himself to become one with us and even to die on the cross, and for that reason he was exalted, high above every name that is named every, over every power and authority. And the reason why the man Christ Jesus was exalted to such a high position was because he was willing to humble himself the most and serve us and bring us to God. We need to follow his example. If you would be great in the kingdom of heaven, if you would be greatest, the one who follows it the closest is the one who will be greatest. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to, um, to understand what he's saying, but most of all, actually to live this kind of life.